Yeah, praise the Lord. I tell you, the Lord deserves that praise. He deserves all that we could give and more than we could ever give. God is so good to us and blesses us in so many ways that it's just overwhelming. I tell you, in studying the book of Daniel, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a long time since I've been in the book of Daniel, as much as I have been the last three or four weeks. But in being there and in, and in reading it and studying it and not really studying the prophetic part about it, the book of Daniel is half of the book, the first six chapters, are historical chapters. They're chapters that talk about the history of Israel when they were in captivity in Babylon because of sin and rebellion against God. God sent them into captivity in order to discipline them and correct them so that their lives could be better and be blessed, which is what God does to his children. God might punish the evil, but he, he doesn't punish his children. God is not looking for a way to put the hammer on you. He's not looking for a way to hurt you or to teach you, you know, to be angry and teach you a lesson. That's not the nature of God. God punished Christ on the cross. Isaiah says that by his stripes, we are healed. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, not upon us. And by his stripes, we are healed. So God doesn't punish us because he's already punished Christ on the cross for us. But in the meantime, God does discipline and correct his children in order to do them good. A one sentence summary for this entire series so, you know, would be this. If you have been seduced by pride, then you are stubborn and you are easily deceived. The three messages that have come before have been about how pride seduces you and Nebuchadnezzar is the king that kept being drawn back into prideful situations even though God over and over. You know, the thing that's strange about Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was not, an, was not, a, was not a Hebrew. Nebuchadnezzar was a Babylonian. He was not one of God's chosen children, yet it just amazes me at how often God went back to Nebuchadnezzar and tried to capture Nebuchadnezzar's heart and attention. It's just amazing how much God offered to Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar was seduced by his pride, and God finally taught him his lesson, and when he learned it, then his, his captivity was turned. And then Belshazzar was the king that was stubborn. He saw the handwriting on the wall, now, Belshazzar learned his lesson, but he didn't live long enough to practice it, really, because that night he was slain. Darius the Mede became the king. And then Darius, of course, Darius is the one with Daniel in the lion's den, and Daniel, uh, Darius was deceived because he had an inferiority about himself. And I, I told you in this series that, in my opinion, now I'm not a psychiatrist or the son of a psychiatrist, but in my opinion, the root of pride is in, uh, is in insecurity. If you are insecure, if you feel inferior, if you feel like you have to prove yourself and that others won't receive you unless you can you know, be something bigger than you are, then you are set up for pride. And the enemy comes and he deceives you. When you are a prideful person, you can be easily deceived in life. And so this is where we've been, and we have one more message left, and, it's, and it, it comes from really uh, a few of the remaining chapters of the book of Daniel, and it's concerning a king that's not really a Babylonian, actually. His name is Cyrus, King Cyrus. He's called Cyrus the Great. He's the king of Persia, and uh, God uses him in a very unique way uh, in the ministry of Daniel and the children of Israel. Um, in Daniel, I want to tell, share with you that in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's the most amazing book, and I've already shared a little bit uh, with you about this, about Daniel chapter 11. But Daniel is, Daniel has to be one of the most frustrating books for people who do not want to believe God of any book in the Bible. Because the book of Daniel is so precise about things, and the book of Daniel has so much information in it that is just purely 
historical, provable, um, the historians of like Josephus and and uh, and and uh, Xenophon and and some of the other great Herodias, those historians that wrote that are well known and well favored in human history wrote all kinds of things that that Daniel uh, proves out and proves to be true about what Daniel's saying, and it just has to be extremely frustrating, I think, to somebody who really doesn't want to believe God or believe that there is a God, that, that uh, uh, there could be such evidence as this, like Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 actually tells us the year that the Messiah is going to be crucified. Now, that is an amazing thing. This book was written 500 years before Jesus was born, and yet it tells us that the Messiah shall be, and this is the word it used, the Messiah is going to be cut off. But not, and the actual verse says, and the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. In other words, Jesus is going to die on a cross, and it identifies the year, and, then, and, 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 and he says, but he's not going to die for himself. And we know why, because he died for us. Daniel chapter 11, I told you, uh, and, and I've kind of done a little commercial about it and all that kind of stuff. It starts with the events that happen in Babylon that we're reading about in these other chapters, and it goes all the way through past, it goes past the rapture, past the tribulation, past the battle of Armageddon. And I mean, verse by verse, it says what will happen. It tells about the, uh, the, the, um, the, the Iran and Iraq. It tells you about the, all of the religious things, and all the Muslims. And, I mean, it's just unbelievable 500 years before Jesus was even born. And Nebuchadnezzar, you remember, had a dream. And this is one of the amazing things also. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he calls his soothsayers and astrologers and music, uh, magicians in and says, now look, here's what I want you to do. I, I, not, I not only want you to interpret the dream, I want, to tell you, I want you to tell me what I dreamed. And he said, so if you can't tell me what I dreamed and give me the interpretation of it, I'm going to put you all to death. And of course, Daniel was a young teenager at the time, and he had been taken as, as a captive by Israel, and he was part of the wise men and so forth. Well, when they went to get Daniel, Daniel said, uh, well, take me to the king. And he took him to the king, and he said, king, he said, now I'm not telling you that I can tell you what you dreamed about, but there's a God in heaven that reveals dreams, and he uses me. And so God can tell you what you dreamed. And he said, here's what you dreamed, Nebuchadnezzar. You dreamed of a giant statue. And this statue had a head that was gold, made out of gold. And it had arms and shoulders that were made out of silver. And it had a waist and thighs that were made out of bronze. It had legs of iron. And it had toes of iron and clay mixed together. And, and he said, and here's what it means. The head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar, is you. You are the head of gold. But your kingdom will be taken one day by a, in, a, a, an inferior kingdom, the kingdom of silver, and it'll be a divided kingdom of the Medes and the, per, and the Persians. And then that kingdom is going to fall, and they're going to fall to a, a tremendously powerful kingdom, and, and, and then that kingdom is going to fall to a even greater kingdom and more powerful kingdom than that. And then one day there will be a kingdom, and we all know that that's talking about during the tribulation, that'll be partly strong and partly weak, toes of iron and clay. This was all spoken by Daniel the prophet. Now what, what happened? You'll remember that uh, the Babylonians ruled uh, the area until they were taken over by the Medes and the Persians. Then the Medes and the Persians ruled the area until Alexander the Great came along with the great Greek empire. And the Greek empire took almost the whole known world at the time. And the Greek empire, because Alexander died quickly, Alexander the Great died when he was 32 years old. I don't know if you're aware of that. And he didn't die in battle. He died of a fever of some kind. And he died quickly. And when he died, he didn't have an heir. So there was no one to give the kingdom to, so his four generals took over the kingdom, uh, the Greek kingdom, and divided it into four sections. And two of those Greek kingdoms t 
Ptolemy and Seleucid, and I know if you've studied history, the, you've ter- studied those two periods of times, they are the strongest generals and they absorbed the other two and they became basically the two prominent generals of Greece. And then along about 27 years before Christ was born, here comes the Romans again, Caesar Augustus and the mighty Roman Empire. And it was in the Roman Empire that Jesus was born. Daniel said this was the statue and this is the interpretation of the statue. And I'm going to tell you something. I think that deserves a wow, you know? I mean, wow, Daniel, that was what, I mean, that's the dream and that's what it meant and that is exactly what happened. And the reason that I'm telling you this is because it shows that God is in control of this world that we live in. God is in control of the events, the people, It's already been written down. God is in control of everything. And if God controlled all of that that I just said in just a little brief, tiny nugget there, imagine what God controls everything about your life, about my life, about America, about the history of the world, about where it's going, and, 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 and everything about it. God is in control. So it's not a worrisome thing for me to think that God doesn't know how to control this world or that he doesn't have it in the palm of his hand. You remember I started with the, with the conclusion that, you know, if, you're, if you've been seduced by pride, you're stubborn and you're easily deceived. Some of the worst meetings I have ever had have been with prideful people. They're stubborn and they're deceived and no matter what you say to them or no matter what you show them, it's not going to make you, it doesn't make any difference to them at all because it's kind of like, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind's made up. Now, I'll meet any time and have had great meetings with humble people because with humble people, you can work things out. You can get things together. You can make some concessions. You can have some progress in life. But prideful people are a real, a real pain in life. And so God goes to the trouble to humble us in our life. And the big question to me would be, why in the world would God go to so much trouble to humble you? I mean, why wouldn't God just let you go? I, I mean, you're a stubborn person. You're, a, you're, um, you, you, you're deluded by pride and, 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 and you're going your own way and you think you know it all and you got it all together. Why in the world would God go to the trouble to challenge your life? Well, I think it's wrapped up, or at least one of the major reasons, wrapped up in, one, in a verse that we quote all the time. However, we quote it wrong most of the time, but we do quote at it, and it's a book out of, and it's a verse out of Proverbs, Proverbs 16, and Proverbs 16 says, uh, well, this is the way we quote it, uh, pride, pride goeth before a fall. And we, we quote that when we see somebody proud. Pride goeth before a fall. But that's not actually what the verse says. The, actually, the verse says pride goes before what? Destruction. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit goes before a fall. So why would God go to all the effort to humble you? I think the answer is pretty easy, right? Because God doesn't want you to be destroyed. Because God loves you. Because God has, like Billy Graham used to say all the time in every sermon he ever preached, God loves you and he has a marvelous plan for your life. And he really does. And so God goes to the trouble to stop that pride in our life because pride is going to destroy us and because God wants to bless our life. Let me give you three reasons why God tries to reverse pride in your life. Number one, God wants to do you good. God's plans for you are good. And God wants to do you good. Look at Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, verse 16. And this comes in the, in the midst of a, of a long uh, discussion about what God had done for Israel. And this is verse 18. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you, and that he might do you good in the end. So there it is written straight out of the word, straight from the scripture, God's intention in in your life is to do you good. What God wants for you is good. 
And God wants to be able to participate so that he can do you good. I think every Christian who knows really anything about the Lord can quote a verse that we quote all the time, Romans 8, 28, that says what? For we know that all things work for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Well, that's exactly what Daniel says to Israel when they're in exile. Look in Daniel chapter nine, first couple of verses. See what Daniel said to him. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the, say that four or five times, of the lineage of the Medes, who was, made, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. You remember I told you that Cyrus, Darius wasn't really the king, but Cyrus made him king because he was a, a great general and he participated in the capture of the city of Babylon. So anyway, that, that just backs, that little sentence backs that up. Who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in desolations uh, of Jerusalem. So here's Daniel saying to Israel, Israel, I have read the book of Jeremiah. And when I read the book of Jeremiah, the Lord let me know in, by the prophet Jeremiah that we were going to have to spend 70 years in, in, in this desolation that we're in. You like to see it? Uh, Jeremiah 24, look at it, verse five. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, like these, by the way, this verse was written before they went into captivity. So God's telling them through Jeremiah what's gonna happen to them. Daniel just read it while he was in captivity and said, this is what God said through Jeremiah. This was 150 years, by the way. Jeremiah wrote 150 years before Daniel if that gives you any idea of how, of how God manages his world that he lives in. Daniel, Jeremiah said, thus says the Lord God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah, whom I have sent out of this place, everybody read those next four words, for their own good <laughs> into the land of the Chaldeans, which is Babylon, the land of Chaldeans or Babylon. That's where, that's where Job came from, Ur of the Chaldees, Ur of the Chaldeans. That's, that was where Abraham came out of. So as I mentioned to you before, God's not out to punish his children. God's not out to get back at his children. God disciplines us. God corrects us in order to do us good. And so God tells them, tells Israel through Daniel, literally his plan for them. In a verse we quote all the time, Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Does anybody know Jeremiah 29, verse 11, just without even looking at it? Is it up on the board? Yep. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you future and a hope. This is a verse we quote. This is a verse, I don't know if any of you grew up. Did you grow up with this little ceramic piece of, uh, loaf of bread that's set in, on your table? Like, especially if you at grandmother's table, that's where I remember it specifically. My grandmother, and then right in the middle of her table, there was this little ceramic loaf of bread about this big. And in this ceramic loaf of bread, it was open in the middle and there were little uh, cards, like little stiff index type little uh, cards that were about as wide as your finger. And, 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 you'd, and you'd pick one up and you would read it and it had a scripture on it. And then when you read it, then you would put it at the back, and then the next day you would pick up the one on the front, and it was called, that little, it had written on it, the bread of life. And what it was, it was like a little daily Bible reading, reading a verse every day. Well, Jeremiah 29, 11 is one of those verses I remember specifically, because God says, I know what I think about you, and I know that what my plans are for you, to do you good and to give you a future in life. Now, we quote that verse quite often, but do you notice something about the verse? The verse begins with a, with, with, with a preposition, for. Uh, I studied a great, by the way, I don't know, I, I studied, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you this. I studied about an hour on this one little thing right here I'm about to tell you. And this shows you how, I don't know, captivated you can get in something. And I still don't know the answer to it. But the word, the, all right, when you have a sentence that begins with a preposition, that links that sentence to a previous thought. 
also a conjunction. So four could be a conjunction. And I studied the rule and studied the rule and read different things and studied, and I still hadn't figured out whether it's a conjunction in this sentence or whether it's a preposition. It is a preposition, but whether it acts as a conjunction. But anyway, what I want to say to you, well, welcome to my world. Um, what I want to say to you is, it means something. We quote that verse all the time, for I know. And most of the time we leave out the for. We just say, I know my thoughts toward you, good, to do you good and to have future. But it begins with for, which tells me that for, what is that for for? You know, what, what, what is connected to that? What does that mean? Well, what it means is it means that verse 11 has a context. It means that verse 11 is connected to something. And what it's connected to has everything to do with what the verse is talking about, right? So, obviously, what would, where would we go to find what it's connected to? Well, let's go back to the 10th verse. And notice the 10th verse. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are complete in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know my thoughts, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you future and a hope. So this verse that we actually quote about God knowing his thoughts toward us actually had to do, the context is, God is talking to Israel while they are in captivity for 70 years in Babylon, being corrected and disciplined, God says, look, guys, don't lose hope because you're going to be here for 70 years, but it's, that's, not your, that's not forever. And I know what I'm thinking about you. And I, I, look, what I have planned for you is not to harm you and not to hurt you in some way, but to, but to give you a future and give you a hope. So keep in mind, the good news is, if you are going through something right now, no matter what it is, whether you're being disciplined or you're being corrected or uh, it's a hard time, it's tough, it seems like it's distant, just keep this in mind. It is for your own good. God's doing this for your good, to do you good in the end, to make your life better, to take better care, to give you a hope and a future. I tell you what, you can't find a single person in the Bible that God uses that didn't go through something like this. God always, I mean, Joseph as an example. Most of us know Joseph. You know, Joseph with the coat of many colors thrown into the pit and sold uh, uh, to the caravan that came by, uh, got delivered down to Egypt uh, and, and, and became second in charge and saved all of Israel because of the silos of grain and the fat cows and the skinny cows. And all. I mean, you know, that's the story. Well, do you know before all that happened to Joseph, what happened to Joseph? I think Joseph had a pride problem. When Joseph was a kid... Well, actually, he was about 17 when he finally said what he said. Now, I'm not against 17-year-olds, and I know that a 17-year-old can be mature in lots of ways. I've never met any that are, but I, I, I would submit that they could be. But, but, but here's what happened. This is the way Joseph was before God did what he did in his life. Joseph, God gave Joseph a, a couple of dreams and one, and one of the dreams was like the, the sun, the moon, and the stars were out there, and the, and, and, and the moon began to bow down to a star, and the sun bowed down to a star, and the interpretation of all that was that his whole family was going to end up bowing down to him, which did happen, by the way, when they came down to Egypt to try to get some food to keep from starving to death. But here is Joseph as a young man who is prideful, whose daddy has already given him a coat of many colors, which said to his brothers, dad loves me more than he loves you. Yeah. And I, here's what I'm thinking. Why in the world would a young boy that is hated by his brothers, that is despised by his family, going to tell them that he had a dream and that God told him he was going to be the greatest and they were going to bow down to him one day. Other than ignorance, why would you say that to somebody? 
that was bigger than you, stronger than you, tougher than you. I mean, they can harm you and kill. Why would you say that to them? You're so full of pride. That's exactly right. So God took an opportunity to train Daniel, I mean, train Joseph, and turn Joseph into the kind of a man that God could use to save the nation of Israel. And Bible is filled with that. God wants to do you good. Let me give you another couple of scriptures before we move on, because these will be important, all right? These are the last, I don't want to get digging deep in this. Uh, I talked to the people, I talked to my group Wednesday about this. And I dug them a hole, and I don't know if they've recovered yet. But uh, it was about these two verses that we're about to read. These two verses in Second Chronicles chapter 36 are the last two verses of the Hebrew Bible. You guys know the Hebrews have a different Bible than us, right? Hebrew Bible, Christian Bible, not the same Bible. Hebrew Bible has an Old Testament, same as our Old Testament. Same books, same writings, same everything. They don't have a New Testament because Jesus is not the Messiah to them. So there was no New Testament for, for the Hebrew Bible, only the Old Testament. Now, the only difference between the Hebrew, Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures are that we have 39 books in our Christian scriptures, and it ends with Malachi, which is a minor prophet. That's the last book of the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible only has 24 books in it, but they are the same books as our books. They have the same information that ours has in it. They're only numbered differently. Like we have, here's the pattern of, of, of our Bible, of our Old Testament. Five books of Moses, 12 books of history, five books of poetry, five major prophets, 12 minor prophets. Five, 12, five, five, 12. That's the pattern of our Old Testament. The Hebrews have 24 books. Because where we have the books, history books, of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, they only have Samuel. They put them together. 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. No, Chronicles, put it together. Uh, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. No, Kings, put them together. Ezra, Nehemiah. No, just one book. And they put all 12 of the minor prophets together in a book called Writings. But it has this, it's all the same verses, it's all the same facts, it's all the same everything, it's just a different, a different order. And chronologically, the last book of the Old Testament for the Hebrews is the book of Second Chronicles, is our book of Second Chronicles. And the last two verses of their Bible are, are these two verses that we're about to read. Look at them, verse 22. I know, I know this is not very exciting to you, but I, I get fired up about things like this. Verse, it means something to me, all right. Verse, tw verse 22. Now in the first year, listen to what, the, these are the last two verses of their Bible. This is the last two, this is, these are the last two verses that they ever hear. These are the last two scriptural passages that the, that the Hebrews have received. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me. This is Cyrus's proclamation now. And he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea, who is among you of all, of, of all his people. May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Now what this is saying is, Cyrus, the Persian king, who is now in control of all of the children of Israel in Babylonian, what, what used to be Babylonian captivity. Now they're the Medes and the Persians have them and Cyrus is the Persian king. Cyrus the Great. And he says, God has shown me that I, Cyrus the Persian, I'm responsible for building God a house, everybody say a temple, a temple, in Jerusalem. 
And I'm going to let everybody, every Jewish man that's able, go back to Jerusalem to build the city and build the temple, and I'm going to finance it. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to make sure it's done. Now, these are the last two verses of the Hebrew Bible. It just makes it far more significant to me whenever I see Jesus. One of the first things Jesus is walking around when he gets here to this earth, and as he starts his public ministry, one of the first things he does is he begins to walk around this temple. This is the temple that Cyrus built. And he walks around this temple, and that's where he makes the statement, tear this temple down, and in three days, I'll build it back. Of course, they, they, they confused what he meant by that. He wasn't pointing at the temple saying, tear that physical building down, and I'm going to rebuild it in three days. He said, tear this temple down. Yeah. The temple was his body. He said, I'm going to, this temple is going to be torn down, and it's going to be rebuilt in three days, predicting his resurrection. But I just want to remind you that now the temple is not a building somewhere like Cyrus built. The temple's right here. You can pass, you say, I'm the temple of God. This is where the Holy Spirit lives. But it's just significant to me that the last two verses of Scripture they hear has to do with Cyrus and rebuilding of the temple. It's, it's, just, it's just amazing. All right, so God wants to do you good. When God, when, when, when God has plans for you, his plans are good, he wants to do you good, and he can't do you good if you're full of pride. The reason he wants to reverse pride in you is because he wants to do you good. And he can't do it when you're full of pride. Number two, God wants you to know him personally. All right, how many of you know that God knew you before you knew him? You're aware of this? That God knew you before you knew him, no matter what kind of home you come from, no matter what kind of problems you've had in your life, God knew you before you knew him. So here is Daniel reading in the scrolls of Jeremiah. And he comes across a passage in Jeremiah that says, you're going to be here for 70 years. And then he keeps on reading and he goes into a scroll of Isaiah the prophet. And in the scroll of Isaiah, he comes across Cyrus's name. Now this is amazing now, hang with me. So he's reading Jeremiah, then he starts reading Isaiah, and he comes across Cyrus, the, the, the Persian king's name. And he comes across the fact that Cyrus is going to rebuild the temple. All right, this is 150 years before it happened now. Just kind of get that in you. Isaiah 44, by the way, Isaiah 44, the last chapter is 45. They, it's an unfortunate break between these two verses, but these verses are back to back. Isaiah 44, 28 and 45, 1. So let's just see what it says. Here's what it says. This is what Isaiah wrote now. Isaiah said this. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd? and he shall perform all my pleasure. Saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Verse 45, one, which would be the next verse. The, the, the translators split them, but they're really just one big, big verse. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open, uh, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect. So God's saying in Isaiah to Cyrus, who would never have read a word of this, Cyrus would never have read the Hebrew scriptures, he would never know God said anything to him 150 years ago, except for the fact that Israel was captive in Babylon, which Persia took over, and Daniel the prophet read the book of Isaiah, and he had the ear of the king, and when he read Isaiah and it started talking about Cyrus and what God says to Cyrus, Daniel says, Cyrus! Come here, man. You got to see this. God, hey, come here. This is 150 years ago. Look at this. God talked about you 150 years ago, man. And Daniel started telling Cyrus what Isaiah wrote about him. A pagan king. 
not a Jewish king, a pagan king. He said, Cyrus, God said, Cyrus, you're my shepherd. Imagine this. Imagine you're reading something that was written 150 years ago and it has your name in there and it says, Tammy, you're my shepherd. It was 150 years ago and you're going to perform my pleasure and you're going to rebuild Jerusalem and you're going to rebuild the temple and my spirit's going to run in you and I'm going to anoint you and, I, and I've held your right hand. All the battles you've been through, all the victories you've won, all the greatness you have is because I'm holding your right hand. And I did this for my elect's sake. I did this for Israel's sake. And notice what else. This is, this, this is what really killed him. I have even called you by your name, God says. I have named you though you have not known me. God said, Cyrus, I, na I named you. Not only do I know your name, I'm the one who named you. God knows you before you know him. This is 150 years before Cyrus ever even came on the scene. God's telling him, I named you. Now remember the two verses at the, end of the, at the end of the Hebrew Scriptures. Cyrus puts out a decree and says, I, it's in my heart, God has put it in my heart that I'm supposed to rebuild, I'm supposed to build a house for him in Jerusalem and I'm gonna do it because I think this is what God wants me to do and God said this to me and he was fired up and he said, I'm gonna let all you Jews go and build it and I'm gonna finance everything, man. I'm gonna, whatever you need to build that temple, don't worry about paying for it, I'm gonna finance that whole thing for you. Now remember, that's the proclamation. Now here's the amazing story behind the story. The Cyrus's grandfather was the king. And Cyrus's grandfather had a son and named him. Now don't get lost in these names. I'm only going to mention two or three of them. And, they, and, he named, and the grandfather named his son Cambyses I. And Cambyses I became the king after the grandfather. I would tell you that his name was Cyrus I, but that would mess y'all all up. But the grandfather had a son and named him Cambyses I. Cambyses had a son, and before he could name the son, now you know what he would have named him. He would have named him Cambyses too. But he didn't have time to name him. Because when, when the baby boy was born, the old grandfather king had a, had, a, had a dream. This is Herodotus, by the way, the Persian historian called the father of history that tells this. The grandfather had a dream that his grandson was going to grow up and take his kingdom away from him. And so the grandfather called in one of his trusted men and said, take, that, take my grandson out in the wilderness and kill him. And so the trusted, the trusted uh, 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 associate took the boy, little baby, tiny boy, hadn't even been named yet, takes him out in the wilderness while he's on his way in the wilderness. He runs into a shepherd family, a shepherd and his wife, who are carrying a stillborn child. And they're carrying that child to a place where they're going to bury the child. And the associate looks at them and says, let me have the stillborn child and you take the live child. And he'll be your child and you can have, you can raise him. He's your child. And so the associate took the stillborn child back to the king to show the king that the child was dead. And the shepherd family took home the little baby crown prince that didn't even know who he was and everybody thought was dead. And you know what the shepherds named him? Cyrus. The shepherds named the boy Cyrus. And Cyrus grew up for 10 years in that home. He learned everything about being a shepherd. They taught him how to shear the sheep, how to feed the sheep, how to take care of the sheep, how to herd the sheep. Cyrus thought he was a shepherd. 
Cyrus thought that the shepherd mom and dad were his real mom and dad. She, Cyrus didn't know anything about being born to royalty and being taken out by someone and given to a shepherd family. Cyrus knew nothing about that. And so he grew up thinking that he was going to be a shepherd. That's what his life was going to be. Well, back at the palace, grandfather on the, anniversary, on the child's birthday every year goes into a deep depression and just wails all over the palace. Every, and, and, and he does it year after year after year. And finally, after 10 years of this, the trusted associate that took the child out finally came to the king and said, King, the child is not dead. And he told him what he did. And the king said, have him returned. And they went out and they took Cyrus away from the shepherds. He's all confused. He thinks he's being kidnapped. He thinks they're his parents. But after a few months at the palace, he finally learns that indeed, he is a crown prince. Oh, and by the way, the grandfather's dream did come true. He did take the kingdom away from him. So when that baby boy becomes the ruler of the world, Daniel comes to him and says, look right here in this scroll. This was written 150 years ago about you, Cyrus. Look at this. It says that God said, I named you. God said, you are going to be my shepherd, and I know you before you know me. Yeah. And Herodotus, the great historian, he's Persian and Greek, he's he called the father of history, says that when Cyrus heard God say, you are my shepherd, Cyrus knew that God knew him before he knew God. And that's why Cyrus was so intent on rebuilding that temple in Jerusalem because he believed that God really did speak to him and this was God's purpose for his life and this is what God wanted him to do. That God had a plan, God named him, God knew he was a shepherd. No one knew he was a shepherd except God. Cyrus is my shepherd. I called you by your name. I named you. God knows you before you know him. And God wants you to know him personally like this. And if you're full of pride, you're not going to know God like this. God's not going to manifest himself in you as long as you're full of pride. Why would God go to all the trouble to reverse the pride in your life? Because he wants to do you good and because he wants you to know him personally. And then this last one thing, God wants to bring provision into your life. Yeah, God wants to bring provision into your life. God wants to provide. God has a plan. You're committed to his plan. You're submitted to him. You're not full of pride. The pride has been reversed. Now God can work his plan in you. Now that God can work his plan in you, he's going to give provisions for his plan. God's not going to call you to do a plan for him and not provide the resources for it to be done. Look at Ezra chapter 1. Here, here's, here's where some of the resources came from. Ezra, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah were the ones that went back and led the building of the temple and building of the wall around Jerusalem. So here's the book of Ezra. Chapter 1, verse 4. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. All right, so one of the provisions for how we're going to rebuild this temple is we're going to take up an offering and we're going to let people give in this offering and these people can give whatever they want. We're going to use the rebuild temple. But that's not good enough. Look at this. Ezra 3. They also gave money to the masons. That's brick masons, by the way. And the carpenters, thank the Lord. They paid to, they paid to help. And food and drink and oil to all the people of Sidon and Tyre, look at the Tyre, 
to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. In other words, God was providing everything they needed through Cyrus. God was financing his plan by the provision of Cyrus. This is the reversal of pride in your life. When pride is reversed, God begins to do his work, and when he begins to do his work, he supplies the provision for his purpose. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Yoshak, Mashak, and a bungalow, never had want for anything. God provided completely for them. When the children of Israel were in the wilderness wandering around trying to go to the promised land for 40 years, their shoes didn't even wear out. Mm -hmm. Now, ladies, I know that probably comes as a disappointment to you (laughs) because you like a new pair of shoes every now and then, but their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. The whole 40 years they were in the wilderness, their clothes didn't wear out and their shoes didn't wear out. God was providing for them because there wasn't an outlet mall out there for them, you know? And listen to this. As long as God is disciplining you and correcting you, uh, God's going to take care of the provisions that you need in your life. But let me tell you what happened when they finally humbled themselves. When they humbled themselves, they walked right into the promised land. And when they walked into the promised land, guess where they lived? They lived in in houses that were built by giants. Nine-foot-tall sons of Anak. When they went into that house, I mean, imagine that. You go in that house, and it has a king-sized bed built for a nine-foot-tall man. I'm telling you, man, you go in that house, and you get in a king-sized bed, you're in a real king-sized bed. And the giant screen TVs on the wall were made for nine-foot-high giants. Man, imagine that. The door. I mean, everything was there. They just walked right in and inhabited all of these things that were provided by someone else because God provides for his plans. God always does. But the, 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 but, but the choice is to us. Do we, do we humble ourselves? Do we, do, we, do we... I mean, I got some more to say about this, but it's time. Um, I mean, it's our choice. Because the Bible is filled, and I could put up here 50 scriptures. Yeah, huh? Do that one? Okay, I'll write that just a second. Just keep it up there. I could put 50 scriptures up there. I could put probably 25 or 30 um, out of the book of out of the book of Second Chronicles, just just out of the book of Second Chronicles. Where it says, humble themselves, humble themselves, humble themselves, humble themselves, humble themselves, humble themselves. You have to humble yourself. I know, I, I know we, we, we think, well, I don't want to humble myself. I want God to humble me. Well, you've heard me say this before, and this is the absolute truth. God doesn't humble you. You humble yourself. God humiliates you. And then you humble yourself. And frankly, I don't know about you, but I don't want God to have to humiliate me in order for me to humble myself. So how do we humble ourselves? Well, the best picture of humility is Jesus Christ, the most humble person that's ever lived on this earth. And in Philippians 2, it says, and and don't put it up to hand, but it says that, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not a thing to be grasped for, to be equal with God but he made himself of no reputation, took on the form of a servant and died on the cross. For he considered others better than himself. Now, I don't know a better definition of humility than that. There are a lot of definitions for humility, really. Look it up in the dictionary. But the greatest one I know is found in verse three of Philippians two, where Jesus says, think of others as greater than yourself. Not equal to. See, our old crazy world right now is having fits over equality. This isn't equal. This isn't equal. You hear what Jesus said? Jesus said, we're not talking about equal. 
We're talking about you looking at somebody as better than you. Not equal to you, but better than you. That's humility. And that's why it takes the mind of Christ to be a humble person. My mind has to be transformed into a mind that's not about me, but a mind that's about him. And we have to take our thoughts captive or else they'll control our lives. I just want to show you this verse. This is just one of the verses I had in a list of verses. But notice, I just want you to notice what it says. This is one we, we all want to pray and quote all the time. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. I'll heal their land. Do you see what it says? It says before you pray, you got to humble yourself. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Don't pray if you're not humble. God's not hearing it. You're wasting your time. All of the things that God wants to do in our life is wrapped up around the fact that we will humble ourselves in his sight because prideful people are deceitful people. They're stubborn people and you can't work with them. All right, let's just bow. I know. I, I can...